Ah, English Parliament. A fancy room filled with mostly pasty Caucasian men wearing wigs, arguing with each other and passing laws that can decide the fate of an entire country. At first glance, it seems like a pretty boring, bureaucratic, stuffy place. But over its long history, English and then UK Parliament has had its fair share of drama and intrigue, from flamboyant members to full-blown mutinies to the House of Commons nearly exploding. Here's what life was like in the English Parliament over the years. Tudor Parliament Life in Parliament during the Tudor era was a particularly strange place. You had Henry VIII creating an entirely new church, Bloody Mary prosecuting Protestants right after that, and then Elizabeth I pulling a 180 and cracking down on Catholics. They were tumultuous times, and the English Parliament was understandably fraught with drama. Let's start with Henry VIII. In 1529, he convened the so-called Reformation Parliament. Henry really wanted to annul his marriage to his first wife Catherine of Aragon, but the Catholic Church wouldn't let him, so he broke from the church and established himself as the head of the new Church of England. Now, During this time, the Parliament was ablaze with action. It passed a series of acts, including the Acts of Supremacy and Uniformity, that pretty much abolished the Pope's authority. It closed down all the monasteries in England and transferred power over the church to Henry. There were obviously some people in Parliament who were not too pleased with all of this, and during one debate in 1532, two members of Parliament, the Duke of Norfolk and the Bishop of Rochester, quite literally fought each other in the Palace of Westminster. The debate in question concerned the Act in Restraint of Appeals, another of the many acts passed during this time that restricted the power of the Catholic Church in England and made Henry the ultimate authority in matters of religion. The Duke of Norfolk, who supported the Act, was arguing his case when he was interrupted by the Bishop of Rochester, John Fisher, who didn't like what was happening at all. The argument quickly escalated with the two men exchanging insults like, how darest ye disavow the God that doth judge this land, and also, by my stockings I shall smite ye, and other things like that. Eventually, the two threw off their frilly coats and started throwing hands. One account says the Duke of Norfolk punched the Bishop of Rochester in the face, and another suggests that the Bishop of Rochester threw his Bible at Norfolk in a very symbolic sign of frustration and anger. Then there was the reign of Queen Mary I, or Bloody Mary. In her brief reign from 1553 to 1558, she had more than 280 Protestants executed and reinstated a lot of the pro-Catholic legislation that had been created under Henry VIII. As a result, Parliament was again a pretty crazy place to be. One particularly volatile incident occurred in 1555, when a debate in the House of Commons over the issue of religious reform turned violent. During the debate, one member named William Mallet accused another member, Thomas Clarges, of being a heretic and a supporter of Protestantism. Clarges responded by striking Mallet, apparently with his fist and not an actual mallet, and a scuffle broke out between the two men. Other members of the House joined in the melee, and the Speaker of the House was forced to adjourn the session. Sounds like fun times. Remember, remember. More Catholic Protestant antagonism would follow a few years later. Well, follow historically. It was pretty much an ongoing issue throughout the course of English history. But this one was perhaps the most, well, incendiary. At least potentially incendiary. The House of Parliament was nearly blown up with the king inside, and it's been celebrated in England ever since. What, a symbol of good policing? The gunpowder plot was a failed attempt by a group of English Catholics to blow up the Houses of Parliament in London on November 5, 1605. The plotters were attempting to assassinate King James I and the Protestant aristocracy in revenge for their harsh treatment of Catholics in England. The group of plotters, led by Robert Catesby, who recruited several other men, including the infamous Guy Fawkes, to help them carry out the plan. The plotters leased a cellar beneath the House of Lords and filled it with barrels of gunpowder, which they planned to detonate on the opening day of Parliament when King James and all of the important movers and shakers of English society would be present. There would be no Big Bang, though. The plot was discovered when one of the plotters, a guy named Francis Tresham, sent a letter to his brother-in-law, Lord Monteagle, warning him not to attend Parliament on November 5th. Nobody keeps a secret. The letter was eventually passed on to the authorities, who searched the House of Parliament and found Guy Fawkes guarding the barrels of gunpowder down in the cellar. Fawkes was arrested, punished, and eventually confessed to his role in the plot. 
He and his crew were tried and executed for treason. Now, the gunpowder plot had far-reaching consequences for England. It led to harsh new laws and yet more crackdowns on Catholics who were already a persecuted minority in the country, despite Bloody Mary's best efforts to not turn into an alcoholic breakfast drink. It also reinforced the image of Catholics as dangerous enemies of the state, which persisted in England for centuries. Now, the anniversary of the failed plot, November 5th, is still commemorated in England today with bonfires and fireworks. It's known as Bonfire Night or Guy Fawkes Night, and everyone watches V for Vendetta and then burns their televisions. Pride's Purge A little over 40 years later came the only military coup d'etat in English history. It occurred right after England's First and Second Civil Wars, which came in quick succession. Pride's Purge was kind of like the coda to the conflicts and resulted in the unfortunate demise of King Charles I and the subsequent era of the English Commonwealth, led by Oliver Cromwell. The First English Civil War was fought from 1642 to 1646 between the supporters of King Charles I and the supporters of the Parliament. The main beef between the two sides was the struggle for power between the King and Parliament. The King figured that he had a God-given right to rule and that Parliament had no right to challenge his authority. The Parliament, on the other hand, thought that the King had overstepped his bounds and was acting like a tyrant. The conflict, like a lot of conflicts in England over the years, was also fueled by religious differences. This time it was between Anglicans and Puritans. The King was a strong supporter of the Anglican Church, while many members of Parliament were Puritans who wanted to reform the Church. The King's attempts to suppress the Puritans led to further tensions between the two sides. Now, the First Civil War ended with the defeat of King Charles in 1646, and he was thrown in prison. But he still wielded a bunch of power. I mean, he was still king after all. So, two years later, in 1648, came Civil War Part Two. It started off with more royalist uprisings, royalists being the ones who supported the monarchy in Wales, Kent, and Essex. It didn't last very long, though. Over the course of a few months, the royalists were quickly defeated by the parliamentarian forces. In the north of England, a Scottish army invaded in support of the Royalists, but they too were defeated soundly. Enter a guy named Colonel Thomas Pride. In December of 1648, the Parliamentarian army led by General Thomas Fairfax was stationed in London, but a faction of radical MPs led by Colonel Pride believed that the Parliament was too lenient towards the King and his supporters. So, on December 6, 1648, Pride and his supporters carried out a coup, preventing over 200 moderate MPs from entering the House of Commons. The remaining members of Parliament, known as the Rump Parliament, were largely supporters of the army and were more willing to take a hard line against the King. The event became known as Pride's Purge and had pretty significant consequences for the outcome of the English Civil Wars. With the moderate MPs removed from Parliament, the Rump Parliament was able to push through the trial and execution of King Charles I, and that happened in January of 1649. It also paved the way for the establishment of the Commonwealth of England, which was ruled by Oliver Cromwell and his supporters until 1660. Mutiny in the House But we skipped over another violent outburst in Parliament that occurred directly after Pride's Purge. Just a few days after the Purge, on December 12, 1648, there was an insurrection within the House of Commons, this time between the parliamentarians themselves. In 1648, there was a general election held in England. This election was held after the expulsion of royalist members of parliament during Pride's Purge, and only those who supported the parliamentarian cause were allowed to participate. But the election in the town of Preston, England, was particularly contentious. There were two candidates for the parliamentary seat, and both had strong support from different factions within the town. On December 12, 1648, the two candidates and their supporters gathered in the House of Commons to present their case to parliament. Like everything around this time, the debate got heated and supporters of the two candidates started arguing and fighting. The violence escalated and soon there was bedlam in the House. Members of Parliament were attacked and injured and some were even held hostage. Troops were called in to restore order and it was only after several hours of fighting that the rioters were finally kicked out of the building. The Preston election riot highlighted the divisions within the parliamentarian movement. It showed that even those who were fighting on the same side were still deeply divided and couldn't really agree on how to proceed with things. Hatton's Flamboyance Let's go back a bit farther in history of Parliament and look at another colorful character who graced the walls of Parliament. Sir Christopher Hatton was a member of the House of Commons in the 16th century and is best known for his extravagant outfits and gambling habit. He was born in 1540 
and rose to prominence in the court of Queen Elizabeth I, who was said to have been fond of him. Hatton was known for his flamboyant outfits and was often seen wearing elaborate costumes like pink satin suits embroidered with gold and a suit of silver armor he had studded with diamonds. It was sort of bedazzled. He had an expensive taste. He was also apparently a pretty passionate gambler and would often spend tons of money at the gaming tables. Despite his reputation for extravagance, Hatton was a popular member of Parliament and was respected for his brains and eloquent speeches. Not too sure what the other members thought of his diamond-studded suits of armor, though. He served as Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and was a member of the Privy Council, the group of people who advised the Queen herself. Hatton was a royalist and cozied up to Queen Elizabeth quite a bit. He supported her attempts to re-establish the Church of England as the official religion of the country after her predecessor, Bloody Mary, did her best to persecute Protestants and revert the country back to Catholicism. He was also a strong supporter of England's overseas expansion and was a big reason for the establishment of the Virginia Company, which played a key role in the colonization of America. Luckily, his fashion sense never colonized the New World. The Earl of Barrymore Let's take a break from politics proper and get into some of the more colorful personalities that graced the Houses of Parliament over the years. Now, first up, we have the 4th Earl of Barrymore, Richard Barry. Barry was known for his extravagant lifestyle and love for parties during the late 18th and early 19th centuries in England. He was the owner of a lavish estate, where he hosted wild and debaucherous parties with guests from all over British high society. And not only that, sometimes the parties got pretty wild. One of the most notable stories about the 4th Earl of Barrymore involves an incident where he set his petticoat on fire during a party. Barry was apparently dancing too close to some candles when his petticoat caught fire, and instead of trying to put out the flames, he just continued dancing as the fire spread. Fortunately, someone eventually figured they'd rather not see the Earl burn to death, and he was eventually put out and didn't suffer horrible fire-dancing burns, but it did become a pretty legendary story that added to his reputation as a wild party-goer. Apart from his love of parties, the 4th Earl of Barrymore was also known for his love of gambling and horse racing. He was an avid gambler and often placed large bets on horse races, which earned him a reputation as a reckless spender. His extravagant lifestyle eventually caught up with him, and he was forced to sell his estate to pay off his debts. Poor Barry, he's now remembered more for torching his petticoat than for anything he actually accomplished within Parliament. Churchill Cigars We can't talk about the English Parliament without talking about Winston Churchill. And I guess this is a good point to point out that when we say English Parliament, by this point we really mean UK Parliament. The Treaty of Union in 1707 merged Scotland with England and Wales to basically create the UK. Ireland would join a little under 100 years later. But anyway, Churchill. Churchill was known for his unconventional antics in Parliament. He notoriously loved to smoke cigars. No, he really loved to smoke cigars. I mean, he sucked down between 8 to 10 of them every day. He also liked to drink and was often less than sober during debates and events in Parliament. There are quite a few stories about his erratic behavior over the years, a lot of them so strange that they're almost unbelievable. One time, in 1946, Churchill was at a debate in the House of Commons, but fell asleep. When he was woken up by another MP, he stood up and delivered an impassioned speech, but it quickly became clear that he was drunk. He was forced to sit down after what may or may not have been a great speech. Maybe he was rambling on about worms, which he also actually did. During a particularly chaotic session in 1936, he stumbled into the house and shouted, We are all worms, but I believe that I am a glow worm. Then he proceeded to collapse onto the floor. Then there's his exchange with another member of parliament during a debate. At one point, Churchill was interrupted by a labor MP who accused him of being drunk. Churchill replied, I may be drunk, miss, but in the morning I will be sober and you will still be ugly." And then he proceeded to light up a cigar. The stories just keep on coming with Churchill. During another debate in 1952, he was seen slurring his words and struggling to stand up straight. When he was asked to clarify a point he'd made, he reportedly responded by saying, I don't remember what I said, but I'm sure it was right. Despite his love of the sauce, Churchill was a really good orator and gave some pretty amazing speeches over the years. The sensational scenes as Mr. Churchill makes his fighting speech to the United States Congress. Tumultuous applause punctuating every magnetic sentence of the Prime Minister's brilliant oration. It is the duty of those who are charged with the direction of the war to overcome at the early moment the military, 
geographical and political difficulties. His famous We Shall Fight on the Beaches speech, delivered in June 1940, rallied the British people to stand up to German soldier aggression. He also established strong working relationships with other Allied leaders, including U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin. Churchill's leadership during the war was marked by a few key decisions that turned out to be crucial to the Allied resistance to Germans, including the decision to continue fighting after the fall of France in 1940, the decision to launch the Normandy invasion in 1944, and the decision to focus on the war in Europe before turning to the war in Asia. Yet despite his success as a wartime leader, Churchill's legacy wasn't a squeaky clean one. He's been criticized for his colonialist policies, including his opposition to Indian independence and for his support of the use of military force in conflicts like the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya. Grabbing the Mace Let's talk about ceremonial maces. Back in the day, ceremonial maces were actually weapons that were used to protect the kings in England and France. They were held by royal bodyguards called sergeant-at-arms, and the tradition probably started around the 1100s during the reign of King Richard I. Nowadays, though, nobody's at risk of getting their heads caved in by one. They're largely symbolic, and there's one in the House of Commons that dates to the reign of Charles II in the mid-1600s. It's so important that the House is only legally in session when the maze is present at the table. So it's kind of a big deal when someone picks it up in the middle of a session and starts waving it around. In December 2018, Lloyd Russell Moyle, a Labour MP for Brighton, Kemptown, did exactly that during a Brexit debate. Russell Moyle's actions were in protest of the government's handling of Brexit, which he wasn't a fan of and thought would be harmful to the country. He walked to the center of the chamber where the mace is situated on a table and picked it up, which immediately caused the other members to start squawking and jabbering. The Speaker of the House, John Burko, immediately called for order and asked Russell Moyle to return the mace to its rightful place. When he refused, Burko ordered him to leave the chamber, which Russell Moyle did. The incident caused a brief suspension of proceedings, and Russell Moyle was later given a slap on the wrist by the Speaker for his actions. Taking the mace is considered a big no-no in terms of parliamentary rules and tradition. An unauthorized person picking it up is kind of like giving a big middle finger to the authority of the king or queen, who the mace represents. There aren't exactly any clear rules on the consequences of taking the mace, but it's generally believed to be an act of contempt of parliament and could result in suspension from the House or other disciplinary action. Russell Moyle did later apologize for his mace grabbing, saying that he didn't mean to disrespect the House of Commons, but like a lot of people at the time, he was all riled up over Brexit and wasn't happy with how the government was handling it, so he handled the mace. The Suffragette Protest Black Friday In the U.S., Black Friday is the day after Thanksgiving when people storm Walmarts looking for deals on big screen TVs. But in the UK, it has a much different meaning. Black Friday was a day of chaos back in 1910, when suffragettes, women campaigning for the right to vote, stormed Parliament in the same way a bunch of Americans storm shopping centers every year, just for a cause that was way more important than a good deal on a Samsung appliance. The demonstration was led by the Women's Social and Political Union, or WSPU, a militant organization founded in 1903 by Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters Christabel and Sylvia. The WSPU was known for using some pretty aggressive tactics, including hunger strikes, setting things on fire, smashing up buildings, and even blowing them up. On Friday, November 18, 1910, around 300 suffragettes marched to Parliament Square to petition members of Parliament for women's suffrage. The police blocked their path, though, and violence ensued. The police were ordered to clear the streets, and they used truncheons, and even had to use their fists. The protesters fought back, throwing rocks and fighting with sticks. The violence went on for several hours, with both sides getting pretty banged up. Many of the women were arrested, including Emmeline Pankhurst, who went to prison for two months. In the end, the protests definitely helped raise awareness for women's right to vote and highlighted the need for pretty drastic social and political change. In 1918, women over the age of 30 were finally granted the right to vote in England, and in 1928, women were given the same voting rights as men. Another strange consequence of Black Friday was something called the Cat and Mouse Act, the law was introduced by the British government after a lot of the suffragettes who were arrested and imprisoned started using hunger strikes to protest their situations. Authorities responded by force-feeding them, which backfired because a lot of people at the time considered it a form of over-the-line punishment, which sparked public outrage and helped the movement gain more support. So to counter the hunger strikes, the government introduced the prisoners' Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act in 1913. The act allowed hunger-striking suffragettes to be released from prison 
when their health was deemed to be at risk, but they would be rearrested as soon as they had recovered. It became known as the Cat and Mouse Act because it was seen as a game between the government and the suffragettes. The government would release the suffragettes when they were on the brink of death, like a cat playing with a mouse, before rearresting them once they had recovered. Big Wigs Let's talk about wigs. British Parliament used to love them a lot. It seemed like all of Europe had a thing for them at one point. I mean, who doesn't love a big, white, powdery wig that makes your head look like the business end of a mop? Wigs have been used for thousands of years, dating back to ancient Egypt and Greece. In ancient Egypt, wigs were used as a symbol of wealth and social status, and were worn by both men and women. In ancient Greece, wigs were used in the theater to differentiate between characters and to denote social status. In Britain, the use of wigs in the legal and political arena can be traced back to the 17th century. At the time, wigs were becoming fashionable in Europe and were worn by wealthy noblemen. Lawyers and judges started wearing wigs as a symbol of their profession and the practice soon spread over to Parliament. So the use of wigs in Parliament wasn't just for show. The 17th and 18th centuries were a time when personal hygiene wasn't great, and wigs helped to cover up unsightly and often disease-ridden hair. They kind of took off in France, actually, when King Louis XIV, who was starting to go bald at the unfortunate young age of 17, hired about 50 wig makers to help veil his sparse locks. Over in England, King Charles II followed suit. His hair had gone gray from a common disease at the time. Let's call it sniffleless. Over time, wearing wigs in Parliament caught on and became an established tradition. The use of wigs has definitely declined in recent years, but some MPs still wear them at formal events like the state opening of Parliament. What else do you want to know about the British Parliament? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.